So welcome to another episode of Becoming an Ayn Rand Hero, where we use the ideas of Ayn Rand to live a life and a lifestyle with the qualities of Ayn Rand's heroes, to live a heroic life, a life that we can't wait to wake up to. And today, I'm speaking with someone who, uh, as we'll get into, I've actually been following for 15, perhaps even 20 years at this point, uh, Robert Krasinski, an author, thinker, and futurist to a degree. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, that is that is the title I've taken on to myself in uh, in very, fairly recently. Yes, yes, fantastic. And so we're gonna we're gonna be talking about Ayn Rand and uh, especially her books, Atlas Shrugged. Robert's working on a book. I can't wait for it to come out. So excited uh, on Atlas Shrugged. And uh, we've had a taste of it through his blog posts where he really goes into the, the, what's happening in the book and how it relates to current events and, and the underlying themes and philosophy that the characters are working out. And uh, some of my favorite writing on Atlas Shrugged in the, in the last couple of years. I've, I've loved your blog posts and so I'm really excited about this book. So we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about his work with Real Clear Politics, and especially his new venture, Real Clear Future, which, uh, as, we'll, as we'll get into, is, well, since that's where we're headed, we should probably look at where we're going. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> okay, so, so welcome, Robert. Absolute pleasure to be speaking with you. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me on the, on the, the podcast. Okay, great. So I, I tend to like to start with you could say the big fun question, which is how did you get introduced to Ayn Rand? Like how did, how did this come about? What's your story? Right. The, the usual origin story. Well, it's an yeah. interesting one because I was kind of drag kicking and screaming into being an objectivist. Yeah. Uh, back up a little bit. Uh, there's an objectivist by the name of Robert Garmon. Uh, some people, uh, people in the objectivist movement, a fair number of them know him. He's active on Facebook and things like that. He and I went to the same high school together. We were friends 30 some years ago. And uh, he's, he's now teaching at a university in China. Very interesting story he has, he has to tell about his experiences there as an objectivist, mm -hmm. but also somebody who's you know, is teaching po po politics and philosophy and, and English uh, in, in that system. Uh, but he and I went to high school together. <laughs> he's are. the one who discovered Rand. So he's the one, he, like a relative gave him a bunch of books and in there was The Fountainhead and he read it. And the way it started out is he started arguing against me. So he, was, he would bring up these objectivist arguments he was getting from the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, and I would be the one arguing against them back, against, uh, back to him. You were his, now, you were I, his straw man. Uh, in a way, it was, well, the thing is, I was actually a very philosophical, very philosophically interested person at the time. I actually wanted to be an academic philosopher. This is before I encountered Ayn Rand, you know, I just, this is the direction I wanted to go. I was very interested in the big questions, the big ideas and wanting to, to confront those, but I had also sort of steered off in some, what I recognize now to be wrong philosophical <laughs> directions. Um, I, I was actually, politically, I was very close to Ayn Rand's view and it all made sense to me immediately, but it was you know elements of subjectivism and of Kantianism that I had begun to absorb from reading different philosophers and being really engaged in the field. And I don't think I'd absorbed it down at the root, but I had started to sort of view it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Now I was 17 years old, so yeah. you know, take that with all the seriousness involved there. Mm -hmm. I was serious about it, but obviously at 17, I wasn't, you know, you didn't I was have very a tremendous not, amount of experience. <laughs> well, I was not very far along in the process of thinking about these things. Yeah. But the point is that I started arguing against Ayn Rand's ideas. But the thing is, what I knew is, what I give myself credit for is I, I grasped fairly quickly that this is something I had to grapple with, that I had to argue against it. I couldn't just dismiss it and, you know, do the usual thing you get in academia where I always sneer and look down our nose. Oh, that Ayn Rand stuff, it's so unsophisticated. I, I knew Therefore, this, we don't these have serious to address ideas. it. Yeah, these are serious ideas, serious arguments. I had to address them. I couldn't go on thinking in that other line of thought. I, I wasn't familiar with Kant at the time, but I had sort of in retrospect, I realized I've been getting it indirectly through other sort of like secondary and, and, and tertiary sources of those Kantian premises coming through that I, be, you know, it sort of begun to accept as as making sense in some way. Mm -hmm. So when I encountered this, I realized I can't go on with this other line of thought until I've confronted this challenge here from Ayn Rand. 
Now, the thing that's interesting is, you know, most people say, oh, well, you know, they read one of the novels first and then they went to, they, they slowly got into her more philosophical things. But coming from that more philosophical, you know, having that philosophical interest, I went, first thing I did is I went to Atlas Shrugged. And I figured this is the big magnum opus. It's where she states all her big ideas. You know, it's, it is the big book by her. And the funny thing was actually on my bookshelf because my dad had read it in college. And it was <laughs> sitting there on the bookshelf in my own bedroom, in my, in my room when I was a kid for years. And the problem with it is that it was right next to a book by Albert Camus. Existentialist philosophy. Uh, uh, the Myth of Sisyphus. Right, the myth of Sisyphus is this book. He is this Greek myth. He rolls the rock up the hill, and every time he gets to the top, it falls down to the bottom. And Camus basically says, "This is a metaphor for life. This is what life is like." And the only meaningful philosophical question is, "Why not commit suicide?" I read that and decided I hate existentialists. I want nothing to do with them. This is the worst. They're, they're whiners. It's the worst, most defeatist outlook on life you could possibly have. I don't want to read any more existentials. Well, right next to it is this big, thick book with this odd cover. This is the old Robert Heindel cover, this sort of face and the earth cracking apart. And this weird foreign name, Ayn Rand. And I thought, that must be another existentialist. I'm not going to read that. <laughs> Love it. it was contaminated by proximity. It was, you know, it was the assumption I made. I didn't know anything about it. But my dad apparently had read it in college, and he had this copy there. And so... Um, when I found out, you know, from my friend Bob Garmong about, you know, his interest in Ayn Rand and you know, started getting these arguments, and I thought it was interesting, so I picked up Atlas Shrugged. I read about 200 pages into it, and I put it down. I said, no, nah, it's, it's, it's not real. I don't think the book's realistic. You know, that it's very well written. It's very powerful, but I just don't think the world works the way she, you know, she, the way she presents it. And then I had this experience, and I've had other people tell me the same thing over a couple of months. You know, I'm reading the paper, I'm watching TV, and something happens or somebody says something. And I'm like, hey, that's just like something from out of Atlas Shrugged. So after you know, a couple of months of drip, drip, drip of that, I started to think, well, maybe this is realistic. Maybe the world does work the way she's presenting it. And I went back to it, read through the whole thing. But again, being philosophically interested and a little stubborn, uh, that wasn't enough for me. You know, Galt's speech wasn't enough for me. I then went and picked up the introduction to objectivist epistemology because I'm going to go to the second book. Yeah, because I get well. You know, if, if you're interested in philosophy, right, and your philosophical difference isn't primarily in ethics or in politics, I was okay with the politics. I I did really much convincing on that. If your primary thing is you know subjectivism and Kantianism, this whole idea of how do you prove that reality is really real? How do you prove reason is valid? That's the place you have to go. Introduction to objectivist epistemology. This is where I'm going to get the root, to the root of it. And I remember getting to the chapter on axiomatic concepts. And that was it. It's like when I understood <laughs> what she meant by the axiomatic concepts, what she meant by the axioms, why they're valid, and basically why reality is real. And we, you know, why we could accept that reality is real and that that's a, a valid, that's the valid basis of everything. It's like everything else kind of fell into place. Now, obviously, it didn't all fall in place because I didn't know everything yet. It took me a couple more years. Um, actually, I said the last of her major philosophical works I read was uh, uh, The Romantic Manifesto. And I actually was almost reluctant to read it because I'm like, I've agreed with everything up to now. And I'm afraid <laughs> I'm going to disagree with something. <laughs> and I'm afraid, I'm, and, and, you know, because I, I think I'd gotten some ideas of what was in there that it might be sort of her view was that, uh, art was supposed to be philosophically didactic or something like that. Yeah, and, and that was what I was concerned that I would come across. And of course, that's not what was in there at all. So it was this period of a couple of years after that of just learning and, and reading everything and, and getting, uh, absorbing the whole content of it. Mm -hmm. And what helped at that time, I was then, by then off to college, I was getting a degree in philosophy. So I was reading all the other philosophers. I was reading Nietzsche and, and Marx and Kant. I read the Critique of Pure Reason, if you can believe that. It should only be painful. attempted by train. It painful. should only be attempted by a trained professional with proper medical supervision. Yes, <laughs> and, and, and with an entire uh, post hoc reasoning about what he meant by the words at different points because he's, he's so imprecise with language. I describe it as being, especially him, but a lot of philosophers are like this, but especially Kant, 
is you get this feeling of like the guy who first decoded how to how to read hier Egyptian hieroglyphics, right? So this is almost a sense of achievement of wow, I've cracked the code. Because when you read enough Kant, and you know, if you're able to maintain your sanity, you can eventually sort of get to the point where you crack the code of how to translate what he's saying into something that, well, it doesn't really make sense, but something where you can decode what it is exactly he's doing with the ideas mm -hmm. and how the whole system fits together. So it takes a huge amount of work, but there's a certain pride there of, hey, you know, I can, I can decode this thing and decipher these hieroglyphics that he's writing in. Yeah. Um, and the great thing about that is everything I was reading was sort of reinforcing everything that I was, uh, everything I was reading in my coursework was reinforcing what I was reading from her, from her work. Mm -hmm. that, that her, that her critique, it, it, it's interesting. So uh, a, a, bit, a bit about me, I was a, I was a very heavy postmodernist when I encountered oh, Atlas Shrugged. Okay. Right. Yeah. And, and I think there's a lot of value in postmodernism as soon, as long as you understand axioms. Once you understand the idea of axioms, it's like, oh, okay, there's places where postmodernism is useful. It's useful to be able to take multiple perspectives on the same idea. I, I can see where you're going with that. Yeah. Right, right, right. But there's a root. There's a root that actually grounds it. There is, a, in postmodern right. terms, a meta narrative, and it's, and it's axiomatic. You can use these axioms, and, and it grounds this process. It was so painful for me to let that go, to let go of my Kant, to let go of my Heidegger and my Sartre and my Foucault. And, like, because it, it is, once you've learned the postmodern world, it's like you have a special weapon. You have the code and you can yeah. deconstruct yeah. all these things and it, it allows you to avoid actually engaging with so many ideas. It's like that's a tool. That's true, and I think that's the that temptation of it. It, it. it was for me. It gave me a sense of, radical power mm. because because most people had not considered the ideas and so I could enter into any conversation use this tricky logic and yeah. leave them flabbergasted and I right and, and with postmodernists we also had your own jargon right yes yes and and it was and the whole thing is elitist it's like art uh, right. modern art it's not whether it's beautiful it's whether it's whether or not you're breaking the rules in a way that's clever, mm. right? And so, you ha any, anyway, so uh, w when you're describing what you're describing, right, is that right. It was, it's the epistemology. It's the epistemology where it really breaks things open, right? Well, and I think also it's the very kind of, the idea of how you ground the metaphysics of objectivism, how you understand the idea of how that's validated. And once you've got that base, then like, everything else that's built on it can stand firmly and it all it kind of co comes together and has a consistency to it. Yes. But if you don't have that base, you're just going to be swimming. Yes. And once I encountered Ayn Rand in axiomatic thinking and that, her epistemology, I had to go back and revisit all of these <laughs> authors that I, I had gotten a lot of value and power from to recognize, oh, look at all the floating abstractions and stolen concepts everywhere. So when you were going through your philosophy degree, yeah. you actually had her tool set to critique what it exactly. is that you were learning. How did that, uh, so one, what was that like? And two, what was that like pol politically with your professors and your other students? It was interesting. Now, I went to the University of Chicago where there's a certain value in all you know, really hammer and tongs going at it. And they, just made the news recently. I was very proud of this. They made the news recently because they, they put out a letter to all incoming freshmen saying, this is a place where we're not going to have any safe spaces. We're not going to have any trigger warnings. You're going to have to encounter and deal with all the ideas that uh, even ones you don't like, even ones you find disturbing. And I thought that was terrific. Yay. I, Go Chicago Dean. Well, you know, when I was there, we had Hannah Gray was the president of the university. And she was this sort of iron lady. She was sort of a Margaret Thatcher type, I would describe her as. Mm -hmm. And it was very clear to me that she was sort of holding the line against political correctness and postmodernism and all that in favor of the old sort of what University of Chicago was famous for, the great books approach, where you read the great books of Western civilization. Yeah. And everybody does it. Everybody in college does it, not just the philosophy majors. You're going to read Aristotle. You're going to read Plato. You're going to read Thucydides, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so she was really much holding the line on that. And I wondered what happened afterwards, you know, because she had retired some years afterwards and, and whether the university was still like that. So I was very happy to see that there's still enough of that left that they would do that. 
It's so to some extent, I found that, you know, especially in talking to other students, there was this value of if you can, you know, if you've got strong arguments and you can really make your case and be and analyze what they're saying and really make a strong argument that, you know, they're not going to shout you down. They're not going to shut you out because you're politically incorrect. And we did a lot of, we, we caused a lot of trouble on that campus. So Bob Garmon, who I went to high school with, also went to the University of Chicago at the same time as I. And we started up an objectivist club there. Oh, and we fantastic. had all sorts of events. We brought in all sorts of speakers. We had this giant thing, um, probably like a, 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 probably something like a quarter or a third of the students in the whole school went to a debate, a capitalism versus socialism debate that we sponsored. Uh, in 1991, so we just, you know, we caused a lot of stir on that campus with these, uh, bringing these ideas in. Um, and we had John Ridpath and Harry Binswanger as the, our capitalist debaters, and, and we actually co-sponsored it with the Democratic Socialists on campus, and they brought in these two guys, uh, the two socialists, and it was a really interesting debate. So we caused a lot of, you know, a lot of stir there. A uh, little less well received among the professors. Uh, I didn't like <laughs> advertise it too openly, but. Um, you know, I did still like the fact that there were still some professors, especially those associated more with the sort of old school approach of University of Chicago, who were very interested in big ideas. You know, who if you the, who had this idea, you could read Plato and Aristotle and take their ideas seriously as if they really have something to contribute to contemporary life. Most of those people weren't in the philosophy department, unfortunately. Uh, they were in, uh, I took a lot of classes in the political science department. Now, the political science department was odd because it was a bunch of, like, mathematically oriented pub, uh, public choice policy wonk types, and then a bunch of guys who basically were teaching political philosophy. Mm -hmm. So I took, took, you know, I'd take courses like, uh, there's a guy who did a graduate seminar on, um, uh, on John Locke, where we read Locke's treat, uh, essays concerning human understanding. And his treatises, two treatises of government, the first and the second, you know, not just mm -hmm. the second, but the treatises of government, and then tried to find connections between them. You know, how does this epistemology connect mm -hmm. to his, his politics? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of an interesting question, because in a way it doesn't, but if there are connections. <laughs> um, uh, he, he never figured out how they connected, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. But there are things you can, but, you know, really interesting stuff like that, that was really political philosophy and yeah. just straight philosophy. But off in the political science department, it was a very strange kind of setup. But it was there, and it was you know it was something that I really enjoyed doing, um, and and was really a way that I could get a really good education and really get a lot of value out of it, without having to you know run through the rigmarole and jumping through the hoops of uh, the the things they wanted me to learn. I mean, there were a few exceptions. I took a course on logic, which was all like modern symbolic logic. We never, we never studied the, the logical fallacies, you know, which explains why <laughs> it does so often because we never studied them. You never studied the Aristotelian logic. You discovered, you, you discussed, we studied this really Queen useless and, modern symbolic yeah. stuff. And it was confusing because at the same time I was taking courses in abstract mathematics, like high level mathematics, and they used all the same symbols. They just borrowed them straight from, from mathematics. But they used them in different ways, so it was incredibly confusing. But, you know, so there were some things like that that were wastes of time, but there was a lot of stuff that was very valuable in that education. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so I made it through, but I, 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 the thing is, I originally set up to be an academic philosopher, but I kind of realized by the end of my undergraduate that wasn't what I really wanted to do. I didn't have the temperament for academia. Uh, the way campuses are today, I think. If I were a professor, they'd have a permanent protest village. Uh, yeah, <laughs> they'd have a permanent protest village outside my office. Yeah. <laughs> and and depending on your tolerance, that could be quite fun. Or no, thank you very much. There's much better ways to spend your time. <laughs> so, so I like the independence. So, I like the independence of sort of being able to make my own interests and go in my own directions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so you you were on track to become an academic philosopher. And you realize, no, this is not my temperament. Yeah. How did you end up using, what, what's, what's your path from there? Well, the interesting thing is what really pushed me off the academic path was the idea, I think I was, I was giving some sort of presentation, because we used to do these you know, get-togethers for the Objectivist Club, and we'd give presentations on various issues, sort of testing our own knowledge. And I was giving some presentation, and I realized it was some, some political issue, and I couldn't come up with any examples for a major point I was trying to make. I said, well, that's a problem. How come I don't have examples? If I don't have examples, I don't really understand this idea. 
And it started me on the idea of saying, let's go out and immerse ourselves in the world of examples. You know, immerse myself in the world of concretes and the concrete and the concrete controversies. And it set me off in the direction of wanting to go in a more journalistic direction of you know covering politics and political controversies. And I think that's sort of really why I didn't have the temperament for academia, which is the occupational hazard of academia or the standard flaw of academia is the, you know, the being off in the ivory tower. Uh, the way I put it is the problem with intellectuals is that they're interested in ideas as opposed to being interested in the facts that the ideas are supposed to stand for. Mm -hmm. So it's this looking at things in a very abstract way and not being engaged with the world of concrete events. So I sort of went the opposite direction of saying, let's go out there and let's be engaged in that. And I found it to be actually very interesting because I think some academic people types or there are people who are more the, the philosopher types tend to look down on politics as almost like a, a species of uh, professional wrestling, uh, especially this year, you know, and this year they've got a point, you know, cause we've got Donald Trump <laughs> out there who is, you know, he actually comes from the, you know, he actually has this whole career as a, a character within the professional wrestling world and has used those skills in politics. But at the same time in politics, you often do see, a lot of really big issues and big questions and moral controversies becoming the central to the debate. You know, uh, individuals versus collectivism, uh, uh, individual judgment versus uh, uh, um, state control. A lot of different issues about you know what uh, in, in this uh, in this election. I think the big fundamental issue with the rise of Trump on the right is the role of ideas. You know, do we need ideas? Do we need philosophy? Do we need to have a coherent philosophy, or can we just have some strong man who you know some blustering strong man? Believe who, me, who says believe, gonna, believe yeah. me, right? That's yeah, his exactly. philosophy. His philosophy. Exactly. Believe, believe me, me is it's going to be fabulous, right? It's going to yeah, be believe great. Me gonna, believe me, that's that's the totality yeah. of his argument. There are a lot of New York uh, real estate investors who uh, have lost a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> by, by, by agreeing to listen to that, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, but that I, I think that's fascinating about this year is it's almost like the, everybody on the right has decided to try out or at least the, the, the rank and file, the, uh, 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 you know, the supporters, the, the grassroots of the right have decided to try. Let's see if we can just throw out ideas and we don't need them. And just go with a strong man, a blustering guy who's going to give what for to our enemies. And it's like they've decided to do a, a giant experiment in can we have, can we do politics without, without having to learn or deal with ideas? Well, I think we're going to hopefully not experience too badly, the, but we're going to see the results of that. And hopefully, you know, it's not, the damage isn't going to be too bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. that's what I mean by all the big ideas and all the big issues come out in politics uh, eventually and in some way or another. Yeah. And they come out, but they come out in a way that's concrete and grounded to, you know, current controversies and people and personalities and uh, places and the actions and events and wars and, you know, what have you, all these different real concrete events that, that bring those ideas out so that you're not discussing them just in an abstract and philosophical, you know, ivory tower kind of way. Yeah, it, it, it's in, it's interesting. So wh one of the things about Atlas Shrugged that you uh, originally thought, oh, this isn't realistic, right? <laughs> like no one would say this, right? No one. It, but then you, but then you're reading. It's like no, that's that's Eugene Lawson, that's Floyd Ferris. That the you can you can hear the characters, people actually speaking the words of the characters out in yeah. the world and politics. Politics creates an environment where people actually speak the ideas and it becomes concretized. Well, the funny thing about that is a couple of years ago, I had the experience, not a, didn't work out like I wanted, but uh, I had the experience mm -hmm. of being involved briefly with one of the Atlas Trek movie projects that they were working on and trying to do some consulting and give them some guidance as to how to put the script together. It, it, and my work ended up not being used really, but... Um, it gave me the opportunity to spend a lot of time with some of the characters and some of the dialogues and the detailed dialogue of the characters in there. And it, it, it made me realize that, that uh, Mr. Thompson is my favorite Iron Man villain. And the reason Donald he's my Trump? favorite Iron Man was that? No, no, Mr. Yeah. Thompson's different. No, he's different. Mr. Thompson, he's my favorite Iron Man villain because I realized he's not literally speaking. Now, in, in terms of his actions, he's a bad guy. He does all sorts of bad things. But literally, he's not really a villain. He's actually comic relief. 
because he's always doing these, you know, saying these, uh, he's sort of, he's funny. He says these sort of crazy things and always has these crazy ideas going off, shooting off in different directions. And I'm going through his dialogue and trying to, you know, because you have to sort it down because uh, the dialogue is way more than you can use in a movie. So you have to simmer, simmer it down. And I'm going through his dialogue and I'm starting to get a sense for his style of speaking. And I suddenly I realized I've got it. He's Joe Biden. And I realized that if I just think of Joe Biden saying all of his dialogue, it works and it's, you know, it, it guides you perfectly for how he would say something and, and what his character is. Because Joe Biden is this guy who's always, you know, this glad handing politician who's always just sort of letting his mouth run and things come out at random. And he gets crazy ideas and goes off in a certain direction. And that's sort of what Mr. Thompson is, the ultimate pragmatist. Yes. With, so, with, without, without any regard for how does this actually happen? Right. <laughs> exactly. exactly. The, the, no, it's just a crazy idea comes in his head. And he follows it. Yeah. The, the, yeah. O, the over the overlap between philosophy and politics. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I like to think about politics in terms of polis. Right. This is this is the philosophy of how human beings work together right. in groups, in organizations. Yes. Right. And in that sense, politics is a very broad field. It's really about human interaction. That's how I like to think about it. But politics, as it's normally discussed, is governmental politics, and it's using rhetoric to create voting blocks in order to gain power, right? And that's what politics. Right. Politics is really that's, that's rhetoric. Politics in a narrow sense. What? Yeah. That's politics in a narrow sense because yeah, one yes, of the absolutely. things and, that I and in this narrow sense, Fred Thompson, Joe Biden, they're politicians par excellence in this narrow sense, it's only a question yep. of what can we get done? How can we use rhetoric to How create can the, the various blocks? factions to, to work together? Yeah. How, yeah, can how to create factions to work factions. together? And, and, and yeah. so I, I really appreciate that because th there's, a, there's a point where Fred Thompson's, all, oh no, it'll work. No, it's not Fred. Fred Thompson was a senator. We never hear Mr. Thompson's first name. Oh, yes. Thank you. I, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I did. Senator, yes, right? Fred Thompson in the real world. That's another story. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so Mr. Thompson. Yes. Yeah. We, he's always just Mr. Thompson. We never know his first name. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, but one of the interesting things that I'm working on for the like, book, and then one of the next chapters I'm going to be writing is about how Atlas Shrugged really isn't a political novel in that narrower sense. You know, it's kind of interesting. People think, oh, it's a political novel because it deals with the big issues that we debate in politics. But the, one of the interesting things about it is there's no electioneering in Atlas Shrugged. There, there's no elections. There's no political debates. There's no guiding legislation through – we never see any gui legislation being guided through Congress. In fact, we don't have Congress. We have the legislature. We don't have the president. We have the head of the state, you know, and, which I think is very interesting because I think those are cues she's leading – leaving clues that she's leaving us to say you're not in Kansas anymore. This isn't the American political system that you know something's changed and there really isn't political debate. Notice one of the few times any of the, uh, any of the heroes, any of the good guys in the novel is ever asked to say something publicly is when Dagny is blackmailed into going on Bertram Scudder's show to support the regime. So the idea that, you know, it's very clear that the press is rigged so that only certain opinions are allowed to be said. So we're clearly doing, we're almost doing like a not, a uh, of the novel's political in the sense of dealing with the big issues of, you know, government versus the individual, but it's also taking place in a post-political environment in the sense that the system's already been rigged. There's no public debate about politics. Mm -hmm. And the, all, all the politics that exists is basically this back room, you know, smoke filled room uh, machinations between the various villains of trying to form all there's the Tinky Holloway faction and there's the, uh, you know, this other, and the, all the different factions uh, that are forming behind the scenes among the insiders. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting that it's not a political novel in the sense of electoral politics, because that has already been sort of gone out the window. It's already been overthrown in some way. The, before na the, the narrative has been controlled. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so okay. a, politi I, I swear, a political, uh, some titanic political struggle has been waged and lost before the novel begins. Okay, well, so if, if, you, could, if you could give my listeners a, a, a sense for the character of the kinds of analysis that you're doing in Atlas Shrugged, because, because when you talk about, okay, so you've got philosophy, and then you've got politics, so it's just sort of the real world place where people spout opinions, 
right. and take stances and offer arguments, if you can call them that, right, for their stances. This is the place where philosophy concretizes. Right. And in your real, cl real clear politics, you analyze this, you could say in prose, but in your work with yeah. Atlas Shrugged, you, you get to use the, the context of the novel to highlight and show how ridiculous a lot of political <laughs> speech is in terms of controlling mm -hmm. the narrative and the rhetoric. It, could you give a sense for the, the character? What are you trying to accomplish? Well, you know, the funny thing is how I started doing it, which is that I, I had, for various other reasons that I won't get into, I had actually started to do a series of articles on the Bible. Because I'd never read the Bible before, and I had, I've read it and I found, oh, I had some interesting things to say. So I hit a couple articles, and I've gotten, I've gotten through Leviticus. I'm, I'm, I've got some ideas about Josh. It's slow. And I'm, I haven't got a chance to write. It's not a top priority. Yeah. Uh, so it's like, it's like a 20, 10 year project to eventually get to the Old Testament. But it's been very interesting. There's a lot of stuff in there that I didn't really understand, you know, having not really grown up in a religious background. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of interesting things, and they're not, the, you know, there's, there's stuff in the Bible that's not exactly what you think, given what you hear Christians say, or what you hear religious people say, because they look at it from their own perspective. If you look at it from an atheist perspective, you see different things. Some of it's better than I thought, and some of it's worse. But having done a couple articles on the Bible, I said, you know, my readers are going to get restless because I've got this, you know, these objective subscribers. <laughs> I have to give them something that they, they didn't sign up to get churched up with, uh, with articles about, you know, Genesis, the book of Genesis and all that. So I said, well, let me, let me do a couple. I've got a couple interesting ideas for essays on Atlas Shrugged. And when I got into it, I realized I've got a lot more to say here than I really uh, realized going in. And I came up with a whole bunch of different ideas. I said, I really have a book here. And so I started going with that. And the idea was to look at the literary aspects of it and analyze some things about the plot structure and you know, do one about, you know, uh, the idea that John Galt doesn't, you, never, you don't meet him in person until two thirds of the way through the novel. But then looking at all the different ways that you encounter him early on indirectly in the novel and his role throughout the whole thing. And, and it, uh, sort of looking at that from the literary perspective, literary perspective of, you know, how did she deal with this challenge of having a, a protagonist, a you know, major protagonist that you don't meet until the very end and how she, but he's, he's crucial to all the events. So how do you bring him back through all the different things that happen in Atlas Shrugged? So literary analysis, also looking at some of the philosophical issues and unpacking those, uh, and also looking a lot at the parallels to current events. So I did a whole thing on, you know, if you were to cast the villains, in Atlas Shrugged, if you were to cast them out of real people, you know, uh, I, I nominated Paul Krugman to be Wesley Mouch, and <laughs> you know, all these different people to, to, you know, who are the real life counterparts of the characters and what is it that's common and connects them together. Um, but the, if I would say one major theme that runs through all the things I'm doing is trying to find ways in which people don't fully understand or misunderstand or where there's things that are hidden, where even on my 10th reading through the novel, there were some new things I was finding out. So things that are hidden or not obvious. Like um, one of the things I found most interesting is seeing what is John Galt's character arc, right? Because we normally talk about a character. He starts out a certain way at the beginning of the story. He goes through some trials and tribulations. He changes. And then at the end of the, you know, at the end of the story, he goes through a crisis and then emerges a changed person in some way. That's the typical character arc that a character has. And we can see that clearly with Dagny. We can see it very clearly with Hank Reardon, right? Because he goes through all sort he goes through a very large change. But Galt at first seems to be someone who sort of emerges, you know, like Athena out of the skull of Zeus, fully formed, fully armed, and not to change uh, through through the events that, you know, through the last third of the novel when we actually meet him. But I actually make an argument that he does go through a sort of character arc and he does do things that are atypical for him, you know, that, that are different from what he's done all the way up to this, you know, if you go back to all the events in the novel up to the point where he meets Dagny and some of the things that happen after he meets her in the valley and after he meets her after the valley in New York, he does things that are atypical for him and that are totally different from the person he was before. So drawing out these things that people may not have seen or realized before and also doing things that counteract some of the big mis. Uh, misinterpretations and often willful misinterpretations. Like uh, if you look at Galt's motive, 
you know, the, the standard character, the cartoon version of Atlas Shrugged is, oh, all these Ayn Rand heroes, all they care about is money and business, and, you know, they hate <laughs> poor people and all that. I said, well, John Galt spends most of the novel poor, <laughs> working as a track worker, you know. And he, gives up the the, he gives up the lucrative career in order to follow what his moral compass. And most of the other heroes in Atlas Shrugged give up a fortune at some point during the, during the, during the course of the novel. And if you look at his actual motivation, and the way I put it is, uh, all an Ayn Rand hero really wants is love. Because if you look at John Gall's motivation, you know, they don't care so much about money because they've got money. They, can get, they know they can get money. They, can always, they know they're they, able to They are well. producers. They can always take care of themselves. Yeah. They, they have the confidence in their abilities and their skills, and they know they can produce wealth. It's the connection with other people, and it's the uh, desire for friendship and for and for and for love and for being able to have someone with common values that be able to find a connection to someone with common values that is a huge motivation that runs throughout the novel but of course you know people don't get this because i think so many people come in with a pre-programmed idea of here are the philosophical categories people are going to fall into if you like capitalism you must hate poor people and love and only care about money that's the category they come in with, and they don't think to challenge that or question that, even if they're presented with a whole novel where, you know, that doesn't fit that framework. I, actually, I have a question. I have a question about that. This comes to this comes to your personal experience. I, I, I can only think of certainly on one hand people whom I've met who have a critique of Ayn Rand, the, of of any substance who have actually read her and have taken the time to understand her. It, it, it's, it's uncanny. It's, yeah. People have such strong opinions about her, they haven't read her, and, or they certainly didn't take the time to understand the obvious, the obvious things. Perhaps even she said, I do not mean this, I mean this. And, the, and yeah, they and read that, that essay, and they say, oh, and, and then they mischaracterize. Have you met many people who have, you could say, solid arguments against her? Pe people, who, people who in good faith argue against her. Have you met many people like that? Well, I would say people in good faith is a different issue than people who have solid arguments. Because I think there are some people who are approaching it in good faith but have made you know, some errors and don't understand it. And I think those people I counter fairly frequently. I, I, I've, I've spent a lot, you know, I've been writing for the Federalists for a couple of years now, so I've been spending a lot more time among conservatives than I have, you know, and not that I've been distant Randall. from that, but that, you know, <laughs> but I, among I, the conservatives, I, but I've been spending a lot more time with real dyed-in-the-wool conservatives than, you know, talking to them and interacting with them than I had before. And I find a lot of them have a dismissive attitude towards Ayn Rand. And a lot of the time, it is for the reason I stated that they came in with certain preconceptions, certain philosophical categories that were already set in their mind. And they were trying to fit Ayn Rand into that. So is she a materialist or is she religious? Right? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, if you come in with that category, you're not going to be able to understand it. And you either have to be able to realize that that's inadequate and question it and realize that, wait, well, she's making a challenge to that whole idea. Or you just end up sort of making a mess of your understanding of it. And I'd say putting some of those people her, putting are, her into a category in which she doesn't belong, and and, right, and, right. and and not engaging with her ideas in the ways that you and I would most want to engage them. Right. And so something that would seem obvious to us does not seem obvious to them. And I, I don't want to characterize these people necessarily as dishonest, but that they they have some limitation that they haven't been able to overcome in terms of having preconceived notions that they weren't able to figure out how to, how to challenge. And that preconceived notion, when they go in and read, even when they encounter it, mm -hmm. their preconceived notion doesn't even give them the sense that you had when you read her, which is, I must address this. Yeah, I, have to I must this. engage with this because this is potentially a game changer. And therefore, yeah, I have to dig in. And they don't even experience that. I should say in some ways that's easier to do though when you're 17 because you're less entrenched in your commitment to an existing point of view. Yeah. But yeah, yeah even, I, I, even I at 22 I was fortunate. What was that? I said even at 22 after my college training yeah. uh, I was fortunate that it that I was 22. 
Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it is, you know, it's, it's, it's easier the younger you are and the less entrenched you are in those assumptions. But that's part of, mm -hmm. part of what I'm trying to do with the book is, you know, find find things that will be new even to hardcore fans who have studied it for a long time. Find little angles about, you know, what the motivations of the characters or parallels and uh, to real life or pa parallels to certain events. Uh, I, I did one sort of comparing Atlas Shrugged to the Fountainhead, uh, mm -hmm. talking about you know, the question I posed is, did Dominique Franklin win? Because her whole outlook of the Fountainhead is, everything's awful, so let's hasten the, hasten the destruction, right? Is that what John Galt and the Strikers are doing in Atlas Shrugged? And, you know, how is Ayn Rand approaching that issue differently in the two novels? Uh, you know, and, and unpacking that issue. And that's something that I think, you know, would be new even to people who, who understand and, and accept and agree with the novel, but I've read it a long time. I try to find things that maybe are, are new to them, as well as finding things that will challenge the preconceptions of people who uh, have read it and not been able to really make that leap to absorb how new the ideas are. In, in that case, I'll say, I think that you are extraordinarily successful, right? I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm someone who has read the novel, you know, 20, 30 times, and certainly parts of it many, many, many times. And... Um, you you give me new insights into it, and and it's especially it's especially pleasurable for me because it's a territory that I care a lot about. I'm very familiar with it, and when you show me a new angle, when you have me look at these two facts together in a way that I hadn't before, it's uh, it's truly satisfying. Well, that, that's truly, what I'm going for. Is I'm really hoping that that people will. Like I said, they won't feel like they're just getting the same thing they've heard before, that they'll get something new and interesting out of it, and something will hit them from a crazy angle they hadn't thought of before. Yeah, again, I'll, I'll say you've done a beautiful job. I can't wait to see the whole thing in process, and perhaps <laughs> yeah, I'll have you back. I'm putting in place on it. Great. Perhaps I'll have you back uh, on when, when, it, when it publishes. So, so with that, with that mm -hmm. um, you, you, said, you said earlier that people were getting caught up in the ideas rather than the facts that the ideas are pointing to, or the facts the ideas right. represent, right? And this is, uh, it, it, well, when people are new to objectivism, it's often common, they get caught up in the philosophy of it, in the logic of the philosophy, the logic. and in the argument of the philosophy, right? I call it the trap of the Ayn Rand speech, which is <laughs> that you want to be the character giving the speech, Right, right. <laughs> right. It's uh, right. what's described as the Mary Sue effect. Uh, if you've in, in, uh, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, it's, it comes from fan fiction. And there's, thank God there's not a lot of uh, uh, Ayn Rand fan fiction out there. But in Star Trek fan fiction, there's an old, uh, somebody did a, a parody of bad Star Trek fan fiction where the main character is Mary Sue and she's an obvious like, stand in for the author. So, like an override. So, a Mary Sue in, in, in fan fiction or in science fiction. A Mary Sue is a sort of unrealistically over-idealized stand-in for yourself so that you can live vicariously through this story. Mm -hmm. And somebody once put it to me, a friend just once put it to me, that there are some people who want to Mary Sue themselves as an Atlas Drug character. Mm -hmm. you know, so they, they want to sort of like play act. It's like LARPing. You know, they want to play yeah. act being an Ayn Rand character, and by giving, but, but doing it not in the sense of acquiring the actual virtues uh, and the actual outlook and applying it in their own way, but by sort of repeating and, pro and play acting what the, the style and the look and the feel of the, it, of the novel. Ex exactly. The characters spend, the, the, the full bulk of the novel is the characters setting goals, facing challenges, overcoming challenges, demonstrating their creative genius, making things happen. Right? That's, well, really my, what, that's really what the book is about. And then you get Francisco's speech as... Well, what is what is the first speech in Atlas Shrugged? The first actual speech that occurs. You just said it. Is it is it the money speech? It's Francisco's money speech. Where does it occur? Uh, in the second it part of the book, it, it, at, at James Taggart's wedding. Right, it occurs about four hundred pages into Atlas Shrugged. Now, four hundred pages is a whole novel in and of itself. So basically, we get about 400 pages of action and of people doing things and doing a lot of things. It's a very densely packed novel before you get the first speech. Yes. And I think that's kind of interesting. You know, it reflects Ayn Rand's outlook that you have the actions first, then you have the speech to explain. Them. Yes. Yes. And, and people, I, I like to think that when people get into objectivism, sometimes they get caught up in the trap of the speech 
They want to yeah. be the Mary Sue, but not the Mary Sue creating the business, solving the pro right. technical challenges, right? But the one who's pontificating, the one who's offering the, the unbeatable argument, right? right. And, and, and you could say it's the philosophy versus the life that the philosophy is designed to have you live. Because the right, objectivist that, yeah, philosophy that, that, is, is about living what, what I call the life of an, of an Ayn Rand hero. It's about living a productive, beautiful, satisfying, fulfilling life where you know, happiness is non-contradictory joy. It's pursuing your values, pursuing your values, pursuing your values, and having a life that comes from that. So, mm -hmm. so with that, moving from real clear politics... And your new book does it have a working title, by the way? Your new book. My working title is, is is the title of one of the essays. It might be a little too flippant to use for the final version, but my title is "So Who Is This John Galt Fellow Anyway?" <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. So it's playing but, off uh, of uh, John Galt. That that has its it, merits. Of trying to figure out, you know, because it was the chapter in which I look at him as a character and say, well, you know, what are the specific details and what are the what is the realistic ground? You know, he's not just a guy who gives speeches that he's an actual fully realized character. And I think some people don't realize that the first time around, because you only see him for a little while at the end, and you don't think he changes and all of that. And that's where I went into, you know, how does he change? And what are his characteristic mannerisms? And you know, who is he as a fully fleshed out person? And not just as a guy who gives speeches. So and that so, was so the, use, who is this John Galt fellow anyway? The, the play on John Galt and the flippancy of it, has its merits. I don't know if it's appropriate for it like, like you, you're, playing, you're playing, you're playing, but but I think That's I think important. I I liked it. I like that. I like that title. Okay, so applying the philosophy of Ayn Rand to real life, right, has to do with, from my perspective, it has to do with recognizing where you are, where you're going, and knowledge is contextual. Your life is contextual. What is the context that you're in? And how can you live a great life in that context? And that means, given that it's 2016, right? How do you relate to technological change, right? We, well, that's so. And and and, and I want to lead it. I want to lead into real clear future because, because f from my perspective, right, the world of the future will be different from the world in the past, in the sense of things will be changing. Incre with increasing rapidity, which means that our capacity to adapt becomes increasingly valuable, increasingly critical. And Ayn Rand's philosophy of, is about how to stay true to yourself as you adapt. How do you leverage the possibilities? How do you leverage your best intelligence in the context that you're in? And so I'm curious how you, I, I'm, I'm guessing as you get into your Real Clear Future website, and the work that you're doing and the articles that you're writing, it's about, okay, how do you adapt to this future using this philosophy? If you take Ayn Rand's philosophy seriously, how do you deal with the world? That, or anyway, that, I'll push it in that direction and see where you go. Well, where, where this started actually was after the 2012 election. So Romney lost to Obama. And a lot of people were in despair, like, how could we possibly, you know, Obama's been such a disaster, how could we possibly lose? Well, we nominated Mitt Romney, but <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of reasons why we lost. He's not, he seems, Romney seems way better compared to 2016, but, you know, he was not the best candidate we could have had. But the point is that there were a lot of people who were in despair and thought, oh, no, the world's just going downhill. And if you look only at philosophy and explicit philosophy and people's and the political debate, it can really look like gloom and doom, or it's the Roman Empire, we're collapsing, nothing good is happening. And then I looked over here and I was, you know, I follow these, I already had an interest in this, so I was following it, that there's all sorts of amazing things going on technologically. So this is in 2013, and this is when we first started to see real progress towards self-driving cars. And back then, it was just a few people whispering, saying, wait, I think we can really do this. And now, of course, you know, you can take a self-driving Uber in Pittsburgh as of this week. Right. So, but we we're, it was this emer incredible emergence of all sorts of amazing new things in technology. So I did a series on that, a series of articles on that. I called it, we are all futurists now with the idea being that, you know, we're going to have to all project the future consequences of things that are happening right now, because it's going to change things radically. 
but it was also sort of like going to our happy place in the midst of bad <laughs> things happening in politics because it was a reminder that, okay, on the top level up here, you know, in the culture, in high culture, and, uh, you know, if you watch prestige TV on HBO, it's all how rotten human beings are. And if you watch politics, there's a lot, a lot of good stuff happening. And, you know, there's a lot of bad things going on. But underneath that, there's a lot of people who are using reason, who are uh, being very bold and enterprising and, and uh, innovative, and who are creating all these amazing things. Uh, so it was looking at that, emerged from looking at that, that I sort of immersed myself in that for a while and then started having some conversations with some people at Real Clear Politics. Now, you know, Real Clear Politics is the main site we have there, but I've been working, they have a number of subsidiary sites on other topics that I'd worked on. So Real Clear uh, World, this foreign policy, and Real Clear Markets that does, you know, markets and, and uh, uh, you know, the stock market and economics and business news. And I proposed, and I had this conversation with one of the top guys at Real Clear, uh, who said, you know, who said, I, I met with Peter Thiel the other day. You know, who he is, the yeah. PayPal billionaire, and sort of, he's the, one of these visionary billionaire guys. And he was talking about all this stuff, and do you know anything about that? And I started going, oh, well, you know, I'm really interested in this. And sort of pushed the idea, we should be covering this. And I came up with the idea of, how about a site called Real Clear Future? And so that started really like a year and a half ago, and it took a while to sort of bring all the pieces together and, and get the site designed and all that. But we just launched a couple months ago, and the idea is to have a site that every day looks at not just at technology uh, in the sense of, you know, what's in the iPhone 7 update, which is like current technology, but looking at it more in terms of what's the current tech what's the technology that's emerging that's maybe five or 15 or 50 years and some you know we get more speculative stuff that's farther out what's the stuff that's coming out there that's not quite here yet and what's the stuff that's really going to have a big impact on our lives how is it going to change the way we live so you know what are you going to do when you have self-driving cars how does that change the way you look at transportation right uh, what, are, what are all the things we're going to do in our cars when we're not driving them uh, and how is that going to affect how we live? One of the biggest things I'm looking at is artificial, what they call quote unquote artificial intelligence, which is a bit of a misnomer because it's not really conceptual thinking. It's yeah. advanced pattern recognition. Yeah, basically. yeah, which, which is why, it, uh, for those in the know, it's moving more and more into machine learning. Right, machine learning, but you know, it, it's really, to be more exact, it's really pattern recognition. It's being able to create computers that do very complex, are able to have a complex ability uh, to look at a lot of data and recognize and sift through that data to find patterns and then use those patterns. Now, it's different from an algorithm. An algorithm is the programmer finds a pattern and he writes an algorithm to make the computer follow that pattern. Machine learning is you feed a lot of data into the computer and the computer finds the patterns and it figures out how to how to do how to do something like how to drive a car you know how to when to stop and how to move and what and how objects around it are going to move and it's able to recognize these patterns and learn how and and develop its own patterns for how to act in response to that but it's really it's more like training it's not really like a human thinking and that's why artificial intelligence is uh, a bit of a misnomer it's not like a human thinking it's more like training a dog right so uh, it, so you know think of it as, as having robotic dogs there to assist us uh, or dogs or horses, you know, the, the self-driving cars really, you know, there used to be self-driving vehicles and they were called horse-drawn carriages because <laughs> yeah. horse, you know, oftentimes the horse knew his way home and he could take you if you know, and I, I had a great grandfather, famous family story of a great grandfather who fell asleep while driving home and, and, and the carriage and the, 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 the horse knew where to go and kept going. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's more similar to an animal level of cognition. But where I, here's where I think the Ayn Rand, the background of, of Ayn Rand's philosophy comes in really handy, is understanding that in the future, more and more things that seems like they required human intelligence, a lot, a lot of stuff that were white collar jobs done by educated people, things that lawyers did, and things that doctors did, and things that nurses did, you know, things that educated, trained people, did, things that accountants did are going to be things that we can have computers do to the extent that involves memory and pattern recognition. And, you know, a lot of work, a lot of the work done by, by white collar people was basically knowing how to fill out forms. Like a lot of work done by lawyers was 
knowing what the forms were that you had to fill out to file a motion or to, uh, to, to put probate together an estate. Exactly. And you have boilerplate language and knowing it was knowing how to take your case, plug it into some boilerplate language and then submit the form. Well, you can eventually train a computer to do that. And there's uh, just links to a piece uh, on our site today, uh, links to an article on um, a guy's come up with a, somebody's come up with a program where you can automate the process of doing a corporate merger. So it's like an artif- you know, it's a software, yeah. artificial intelligence software for, for, file, for putting together the paperwork. You know, so there's thousands of pages of stuff, putting together that paperwork and having it be automated or semi-automated. So there's a lot of paper shuffling and form filling out that didn't really require conceptual thinking, required pattern recognition and memory. That sort of thing is going to be able to auto- the, be automated. The, 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 the kind of uh, local but not personalized creative knowledge that once right. you have that local knowledge, you can systematize it, and anything you can systematize, a computer can do. And, and anything that can be automated eventually will be. <laughs> and so the thing that I think objectivism helps me to grasp is the idea that conceptual level thinking, the creative original thinking, uh, is what really drives everything, and that's the thing that's irreplaceable. And I think we're in the future, we're going to be a situation where anything that can be automated will be, and even mental activities that are not using the very highest level of functioning of conceptual level knowledge, those are going to be automated. And the real future is going to be in making sure that you're in a field where you are working on the conceptual level, where you're coming up with new ideas and you're doing things that are creative that have ever been done or thought of before and not just repeating an existing pattern. And I think that a lot of white collar jobs now that are, you know, allow you to kind of phone it in and just repeat an existing pattern, those are going to go away and the real future is going to be in making sure, you know, the, the, the promise of it is we all get to operate on a higher level and achieve so much more and be so much more productive. But the challenge of it is you have to operate on a higher level. You, you have to do, you can't just, you know, go in, you can't just get a degree, get an accounting certificate and go and be a drone who cranks out the same thing over and over again. <laughs> You have to be the person who's doing the creative thinking and who has a first-hand understanding and is able to deal with complex situations that the algorithms and that the machine learning isn't going to be able to handle. Mm-hmm. So the, 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 the threat is you're not going to be able to do these uh, things you used to do. The promise is you get to do something that's much more creative on a much higher level and is much more productive. Yes, and it's the creativity. I'll, uh, I'll say something uh reasonably quickly. So, so Ayn Rand uh, doing her philosophy on one foot, metaphysics, subjective reality, epistemo- uh, yeah. epistemology, reason, ethics, rational right. self-interest, politics, capitalism, aesthetics, romantic realism, right? These five levels. Right. I, I simplify them down into reality, reason, responsibility, respect, and realization, right? So I just give them all like five, five names. Now, the, the way I like to approach her work is that all of them are interrelated, that it's all one context of working together, that in order to be truly creative, you have to be dealing with reality, using reason, taking responsibility, and then respectfully working with the world and with others in order to bring your vision to fruition. And right. so, that, so that creativity, the kind of creativity that's required is the creativity to actually look at reality, to, to be able to look at the things that the computers can't see yet, right. to use your reason to make that happen. But that requires that you take responsibility and then that you communicate with others in order to make that happen in, and to well, keep that all alive in terms of creativity, that that's the kind of thinking that is going to be most valued and most necessary as we move into an artificial intelligence future. And the big piece I'm working on right now, it's a long, it's going to be a long piece, it's very philosophical, it's going to take me a while to, to work on it, but I'm looking at this, you know, there's a lot of people afraid, oh, artificial intelligence, is going to, it's going to develop a super intelligence, it's going to go exceed, it's going to be going beyond us and make us obsolete and irrelevant. And the thing that I'm looking at is that what people don't realize, and this is very central to objectivist philosophy, what people don't realize is they have this fantasy of machines having intelligence without having the characteristics of volition and motivation. Mm-hmm. 
which are biological care. You know, only a biological creature can have volition, it can make choices, and it can have a motivation of a, a goal it's moving towards. A machine doesn't have that. It can't have that. It can't have, you know, Ayn Rand explained exactly, you know, the idea of the, the immortal robot was her example, right? Mm -hmm. A robot doesn't care whether it eats or not because it doesn't need to eat. Uh, it's not going to decay and, you know, if it doesn't maintain its life. So the idea of volition and motivation, which are these central things that you know, are to our epistemology and to our, uh, and to our ethics and our motivation as a person, these things are central to actually to our ability to use reason and to be able to come up with new ideas is you have to, you know, the mind has incredible, human mind has an incredible ability to do, to recognize patterns, which you can model and imitate with a computer. But what we also have is the ability to choose between those and decide which patterns are relevant and which patterns are not. You know, when you see that when it goes wrong, you know, somebody like a schizophrenic, schizophrenics are great at recognizing patterns, but they're <laughs> patterns that are meaningless. You know, think of uh, the movie A Beautiful Mind. Yeah. Right? He gets trapped up in wrecking all these patterns he sees around him that aren't real. They're just, they're just random or the coincidences. But he, he doesn't have the ability to choose what's a real, what, which one is real and which one's important versus what's just noise. And that ability to, to use volition, to, to realize here's what's actually important and here's what's actually true. That's another thing about AI right now is that they have this serious problem where they can, uh, they have a, they can create artificial intelligence, machine learning things that can notice all these patterns and repeat them, but they can't tell what's true and what's not. <laughs> and that comes from having a consciousness that's directly aware of reality and that's able to choose. And then being able to then choose among that in order to achieve a purpose. That, uh, you know, so having that, that motivation and that goal directedness is also something that a machine isn't going to be able to bring that. A machine only has the purpose that you program into it as the creator of the machine, but it doesn't have its own purpose. So people get, I think, excited about AI is going to become, you know, they, they're either afraid that AI is going to take over the world and it's going to do everything for us, or they're hoping it will take over the world and do everything for us and we won't have to work anymore. But they don't realize how central those human characteristics of volition and motivation that are central to, to ethics and to the meaning of a human life, how essential they are to being able to have an intelligence that's able to come up with new ideas and sort the real from the unreal and the essential from the non-essential. And, and the meaningful from the, the, the beautiful from the ugly. Uh, have you read <laughs> Nick Bostrom's book on superintelligence? Uh, no, that's one of the ones I've got on my list here. Okay, yeah. So, so uh, I, I, this is something I'm quite fascinated with myself, right? Yeah. Um, his, his, his book uh, is an exhaustive exploration of this, right? You, you, uh -huh. could, say, you could say there's one, there's one more fear that people have, which is that you'll end up with uh, an intelligence uh, a machine that is creative enough that it can solve problems, mm -hmm. but it can't tell truth from fact. It can't tell meaningful from unmeaningful. It can't tell beautiful from ugly. And so it's sort of like, a, uh, like imagine a, a car that hadn't been programmed to notice a particular kind of animal or a particular kind of person. Right. And then systematically went around getting really, really good at running over all of those people. <laughs> right. Well, this it's, is the. Uh, it's essentially. I always go back it, to with these things. This is the uh, uh, nomad uh, from his original series. Yes, and, and, a, and it's and uh, it's not it's that it's, it's not it's that programs it's programs intentionally it's trying to kill. It. It's not that it's intentionally trying to kill. It's that it kills on the way to another goal. And trying to trying to uh, create a computer that's that's uh, creative enough, intelligent enough that it can find patterns and then implement new algorithms and then find new patterns and implement new algorithms and take action in the world, right? T to both create something that that's, pa that's so powerful and to give it the motivation strategy to program it to recognize not to do really ugly, destroy all the humans kinds of things. Not because it's, tr not because it's Skynet trying to c kill, c kill humans. It's just that in order to make more paper clips, it decides the best way to go about it is to kill all the humans so that it can make more paper clips, right? And well, I think the, the, the thing is, though, that the, the machines do not have their own motivations. They have the motivations we program to have. Mm -hmm. So we are going to be the ones putting that into them. Now, if any machine can run amok, 
if not properly supervised and all that sort of thing. But the other thing I'm going to point out that I've been arguing in favor of for a while is the idea also that the presumption that we're going to let the machines have all this power and not want any of it for ourselves. I think the real frontier is going to be in brain machine interfaces and in things that can augment our powers as humans. Okay. Right? So instead of, okay, there are going to be these super powerful robots and here we are just the same way we are today, it's going to be more that you know, we're going to be able to give ourselves more memory, give ourselves the ability to process more data, to give ourselves the ability to uh, control more machinery directly ourselves. So I think that you know, we're also going to be augmenting human capabilities themselves. And that's where things get really interesting and philosophically very interesting as well, because then you know, how is it when you expand what we are physically and mentally able to do, how do you do that in a way that doesn't also doesn't wreck your brain in the process, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a very delicate technological and philosophical question to ask. Yeah. But I, I'm I'm very much in the optimistic mode that you know this is going to be a tremendous expansion in human power and human ability to control the world. And I I I kind of doubt you know I doubt that we're going to somehow be so disengaged from this that we're going to lose power over the world. We're going to gain it for ourselves. Well, ex excellent. You'll, you'll find, you'll find uh, Nick Bostrom's book uh, incredibly systematic in going yeah, through yeah. those pieces. And you, you could say that uh, Ray Kurzweil is very much in alignment with what you're saying. It's like, we're just going to keep augmenting ourselves and it's going to be human beings who are still doing the creative work, who are still taking it farther and the computers are going to assist us in becoming more creative and more powerful, right? right Versus right. having the computers actually kind of get out of control and having, having them be so powerful that it's very difficult to stop them, right? You, you could say there's yeah. Kurzweil and Boss. So, so plus, you'll, plus, you'll really like the book. Plus, we could also talk about what's going to happen 30, 50 years from now. But also, I think we have to have a healthy recognition that that is actually a long way off. The yeah. way I put it is... Uh, I'll I'll start I'll start getting afraid of the possibilities of our artificial intelligence when auto when autocorrect stops messing up everything I say. <laughs> uh, yeah, because yeah. our computers are still a very long way from getting to that point of being able to process things in a serious in that serious kind of way. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done to get. I mean, even self-driving cars are really they're just at the beginning. In five years, they'll probably work in uh, they'll work they work they'll work okay. And then even then, they're going to need a lot of improvements. So we're still very much at the beginning of this process. Right. But th th that's what's exciting about it is there's all sorts of amazing things that are going to be coming up. Yes. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, my, one of my personal interests is uh, in terms of motivation strategies for artificial intelligence, right? How do you teach them, right? What are the rules that you give them by which to make choices? What does beautiful look like? Towards what are they attempting to optimize? What are the, what are the right. algorithms there, right? I believe that Ayn Rand's system is a, a, the better you are at that system, the more as a human being you'll be able to leverage technology in a way mm -hmm. that's actually powerful and valuable. So individuals who learn that will become more powerful. Right? You know, uh, my, my job is I work with entrepreneurs. I'm a coach for entrepreneurs. Right. Because entrepreneurs are the ones who are creating. They're the ones who are going beyond the normal. They're finding new opportunities to leverage technology to create something new. That's, that's their thing. And um, whether I don't necessarily tell my clients this, although they learn it over time, right? I teach them how to think like an Ayn Rand hero. I teach them how to focus on reality and use reason and take responsibility and demonstrate respect in service of realization, right? I, and... I believe that in, as we teach uh, machines criteria by which to say this, right, I, I do this pattern recognition, I recognize these patterns and I see this potential, if we take action X, we're more likely to get Y, right? There's this chain. What is the Y that we want? How does the, how does the machine do, like, choose between the various options to say, ah, oh, we want to optimize for this that actually right. using Ayn Rand's ideas of metaphysics and reality and reason and self-interest, the, the, yeah, the, 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 the more we can bring that creating. into what? It's going to be the entrepreneurs who are creating this, who are giving that framework and that overall goal and that overall meaning. 
But what I think that also does mean that that we're going to need th- philosophical guidance even more to be able to know, okay, we've got all this tremendous power we're now being able to harness. Where are we going with that and what are we trying to do with it? Right. In, 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 uh, in the movie Spider-Man, there, there's the famous line where, where he says, with great power comes great responsibility. Right. That's a which, old which, 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 which we, we all cringe at for, for, yeah. for various reasons. But how I adapt it is with great power comes a greater need for rationality. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. The more powerful we you know, become. It's, it's, what Rand said. it's what Ayn Rand said about the nuclear bomb. She said, you know, having the, this a tremendous destructive ability makes uh, bad philosophy, you know, all the more terrifying. <laughs> you know, it, it, having evil political systems like communism or fascism is all the more terrifying when we have these weapons that are so much more powerful. And so it's sort of like a race. I, I view it as, in a way, that it's, it's a race between our uh, intellectual achievement on the technical side and our intellectual achievement on the uh, philosophical and moral side, which is lagging behind our, our achievement on the technological side. Uh, and uh, it's going to need to catch up, or the two are going to need to be integrated to a greater extent than they are now, because the more you have this technological power and ability, the more you can have it go into the service of an evil idea, in the service of evil ends. And that's what the whole, uh, the whole subject line of, of uh, the whole storyline in Atlas Shrugged of Robert Stadler is about. You know, a guy with a great physicist, great discoveries in physics that then get distorted into the ends of a dictatorship. And he was actually based on scientists that she'd interviewed uh, in the Manhattan Project. And noticing this flaw they had of being technologically very scientifically brilliant, but not being not having a uh, not being willing to take a stand in favor of, of of reason in the moral realm and in the political realm, and being the type of sort of people who would build a bomb without really knowing what it was going to be used for. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that 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 in the futurism, one of the things I'm in looking at these, these ideas of futurism and future technology, one of the things I'm sort of crusading for is the idea of we're going to have to have a better understanding of what human nature is and what our goals are. And we're going to have to bring the development of human beings and of our, our moral and, and philosophical ideas, we're going to have to bring that level of development up to match what we're doing with the, uh, in science and technology. Yeah, and, and I understand Ayn Rand's critique of postmodern philosophy, of, of Kantian subjectivism, and moving forward into existentialism and the postmodernists, that her critique of that is uh, a, a fundamental antidote and tonic that is mm-hmm. of crucial importance as we increase our power. That, it is ex- yeah. that it's exactly her critique and her rethinking of the fundamentals that sets the foundation that we can build on. Uh, do you agree with that? Or? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that, uh, like I said, you know, she, she frequently pointed out, and I think she's absolutely correct about this, that there was this, this mismatch between what was happening in philosophy and what was happening in science. That science was marching forward because it has an, almost an inherent base in reason and reality. It has, you know, it's the extent the scientific method survives. There's always this mechanism of self-correcting mechanism of if you have a wrong theory, you're not going to be able to prove it in the laboratory. You're not going to be able to build things. You're not going to be able to land on the moon if you have a wrong theory about physics or computer science or whatever it is that you're using. Whereas, unfortunately, there's not that direct feedback mechanism in philosophy. And in fact, philosophy has systematically undermined it in the last 220, you're right? There's the critique I'm of pure saying, reason, is, the critique of right. practical reason, where you say, exactly. ah, you can't know reality because reason isn't what you think it is. You take right, that out right. of the way and you build an entire philosophical enterprise which is designed to have you not learn reason and not treat reality as if it's real. And now we're, so and it's, that it's must be fixed as science, we increase so our form. What? It's going backwards at the same time that science is going forward. Yeah. And I think there's an organizational thing here. One of the things I'm very interested in is ed, what's called ed tech, which is you know, new ideas in education and you know, use of the internet in higher education. 
and also the ways it sort of breaks down the university system. Because one of the a friend pointed out to me years ago was that the university system is a model of education that's literally a thousand years old. It came out of the monasteries of, of Europe, you know, a thousand years ago. And this, this sort of cloistered ivory tower, we withdraw from the world and we all discuss amongst each other and debate how many angels could dance on the head of a pin. And that's part of the reason why philosophy doesn't have that feedback mechanism in the real world. And why the humanities don't have that feedback mechanism in the real world is they sort of, and the, they have this platonic approach of let's separate ourselves off from the world and talk amongst ourselves and have this consensus that we form within our little academic community. And let's not look out at how these ideas, you know, are working out in the real world, how, how their, what their consequences are in reality. And that's why you get something like communism, which has been tried actually, not just in the 20th century, but in the 19th century. It's a area I'm looking at to work on, do some more research in the future, that the 19th century, there were dozens of experiments in communism, you know, little communes and uh, utopian communities that formed in, in Europe and America. And they failed one after another after another. And everybody, instead of saying, well, this idea doesn't work, everybody said, well, no, let's try it bigger. Let's have the government do it. Let's try it for the whole globe. And then in the 20th century, we try that and it fails and people still won't give up on it. And it's like there's some feedback loop with reality that's been cut off. And I think that has partly to do with the way the, in, the whole intellectual system is designed to be this cloistered area off of the humanities, off of their universities, not connected from the rest of the world and not getting that feedback. Okay. So I think I really, one of the things I'm very interested in is how can new technology, especially new technology that takes on the, the existing system of higher education and brings maybe a new model for higher education, how it can break that apart and maybe break, out the, break up the power of the ivory tower and the influence of the ivory tower okay. and well, make it possible for other, for other ideas outside of that to have an influence. Well, uh... It, it, it sounds like you're continuing the impulse that had you leave the university and get out and start working in <laughs> politics, right? To say, okay, let's no. How does this actually play out, right? Re yeah, there's I a very, very big world. Yeah, there's a very, very big world out there with all sorts of exciting things happening, and we should be engaged with that uh, as as thinkers, as philosophers, as as people who work with ideas. We should be engaged from that learning from it and also trying to offer our direct, you know, what we know and what we uh, offer the guidance that we can offer from our knowledge of philosophy to in a way that connects to that in a real way that people can see the value of it. Great. Well, so, so one of the things I'm excited about, uh, your work, Ed Hudgens, um, Jay Friedenberg, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them and Louise, like the objectivists who were, who were focusing on, future technologies, machine learning, artificial intelligence, singularity, to bring those ideas into the objectivist community so that we can leverage the talent, the understanding in the real world context of how is life progressing? What's happening with society? Um, I, I have an idea I call the bureaucratic singularity, right? Which is, which is basically, <laughs> the, the, thesis, the thesis is that government grows arithmetically, right? So its curve is arithmetic, but technology is exponential. And there's a point where the exponential curve starts changing faster than government can regulate it, right? And I call yeah. that point the bureaucratic singularity. And I argue, I argue that we're at the point of the bureaucratic singularity. We've got blockchain and Twitter and the Arab climate change spring and winter, right? That, that, <laughs> that people are starting people are starting to be able to connect and evolve and innovate and partner faster than the government can stop them well i think uber is a great example of that yeah uh you know and the thing is that we talk about people all you know a lot of people who are who love uber and use uber and who are involved in creating it a lot of them are political liberals or politically on the left but the thing is, what they're doing is one of the great anti-regulatory experiments ever, ever launched because the whole essence of the business is to break down local government regulations on ta that, that created the taxi monopolies. Mm -hmm. And they do it by taking advantage of the, the, say, this, dif this, dis this um, differential between how fast technology moves and how fast bureaucracy moves. And they can create a, if you can create a new technology that basically 
goes outside of that regulatory framework and does an end run around the regulatory framework. And the bureaucrats are plodding along and they haven't even understood what you've done yet. <laughs> and you've already gone beyond them and created this whole system, mm -hmm. which is basically what Uber did. Yeah. And then, you know, you can have this, you can take advantage of that differential between the fast speed at which technology moves and the slow plotting speed at which government moves. Yeah. Now, of course, there's always, but I don't want to overestimate that because there's always the, the impulse of government to come down and see mm -hmm. this thing that's growing fast that it can't control and want to bludgeon it with a club uh, to keep that from happening. Yeah, you, you, Precisely because they don't know it and they don't understand it and they can't control it, it has to die. Yes. Your own Brook, in a couple recent talks, has said something along the lines of, like, you don't understand how vicious the people in power are. That you're trying to create blockchain, you're trying to create these technologies that are good they will come down on you and they have the force of guns. And, and so it's not, it's not an idyllic, right? It, it, the, the great thing I love about Airbnb, I love about Uber, right? I, it, is that they got out in the public and offered so much value to people so quickly that there's now a political constituency that doesn't want to lose it. Right, right. And that was the genius of it, I think, is to create a, create a constituency and so many people who are influential people living in the city, we are well off people living in the city who are influential, who are technologically advanced, so that you have a, you have a constituency that will advocate for you. So, right. you know, it, and the advantages again, are so clear. The, the, the yeah. unforced force of the better argument yes. becomes so obvious that the, the, government trying to create st stories and narratives, trying to control the narrative so that they can justify taking control, it becomes more and more difficult. It requires more creativity on their part. <laughs> well, you know, but it's always, it's always been a, a, a cat and mouse thing. It's always been a, you know, I mean, that's what, Alice, what you see in Atlas Shrugged. You see Dagny going off and creating the John Galt line. Tremendous surge of productivity of these people in Cal Colorado. And then the lumbering effort of the bureaucrats to say, wait a minute, we've got to put a stop to this. And so it's always that, 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 and that's why I think Atlas Shrugged has such, such, uh, and Ayn Rand's ideas in general have such, uh, application and then still reverberate today, even though the technology she was, well, some of this technology she's writing about was fracking, which is. Isn't that crazy? Out. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Ellis, why it was but, you fracking. Know, a lot of heavy industry, it was steel mills and it wasn't, uh, self driving cars and computers and all that. But it still resonates today because that same pattern of, the creative individuals coming up with the new idea, and then somebody saying, "Wait, wait, wait! Stop that! We gotta, we gotta tamp that down." And that battle is always going to be there, and we just have to, you know. But I do think that they need the help of people who have the ideas to say, "Look, what you're fighting is not just a technological battle. You're not just going to come up with a technological idea. You're going to have to deal with these deeper philosophical ideas about the role of government, about the, you know, the creative and the value of the creative individual." These are ideas you're going to have to, to grapple with and be able to understand or else somebody's going to come after you and try to shut down all these amazing things you're doing. Mm -hmm. so, so real clear future, two major parts mm -hmm. of it that I like. One, one of them is because of, your, uh, because of the respect that you've earned in the objectivist community, right? people will be reading your work in real clear future Right. right, who are who are objectivists who understand this philosophy and who can then bring this mindset, this methodology, this philosophy to the world of artificial intelligence and and futurism, right? So that they can yeah. take advantage of it. So we can bring more of that thinking into that realm. Similarly, similarly, as people create these new worlds, these new technologies, they create the Ubers, they create the Airbnbs. Right, they 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 create PayPal, PayPal before it was brought in. We've got Bitcoin. We've got these new worlds that are being brought in. What they don't have is the rhetoric. They don't have the political, ethical reason and rhetoric to say we have a right. Every person has a right to rent out their own home. Every person has a right to drive their own car and use it as a piece. We have the right to do our own transactions. And so I hope that through Real Clear Future, you get to bring more of the objectivist understanding of epistemology and ethics into this interpersonal political realm in the broad sense, so that the people who are creating these technologies 
can have the narrative, can have the philosophy to stand up for what they're doing. So that they can claim, not only is what we're doing good for the public, right? It's, it's good for the public, therefore we should be able to do it, right? They can say, no, well, it is good. good. Public, but at the same time, you have to understand, yeah, the idea it's of being able to in say, and of itself. creative new ideas are good in and of themselves. Yeah, and, and the thing is, you know, I think Silicon Valley is generally regarded that Silicon Valley has moved a little left in the last couple decades. It had a reputation for a certain amount of quote-unquote libertarianism before that. And it, it certainly has prospered in the areas where there's not a lot of regulation. So part of my goal is to sort of bring back some of that understanding of, you know, we need to have freedom as a necessary condition for having able to have all this innovation. And that you need to have this attitude in which the innovation and the new ideas and the people who come up with them are considered valuable in and of themselves and not uh, not just as something that you have to you know justify by some leftist political framework mm -hmm. so uh it's sort of trying to bring back some of that to, to silicon valley i think has been you know uh there's been a little bit more of a leftist orthodoxy culturally that's happened in the last 20 years uh, for no good reason that I can think of, so it's time to really push back and break up, break that up. Yeah, I, I think I think part part of the truly unfortunate uh, consequences of having a left-right divide is that left and right are not good categories. Right, and right. yeah, and I'm, one of the things I've been encouraging is people on the right to get involved in this new technology and understand how amazing this is, and and to be engaged in the, the science and the technology areas. Uh, uh, to, uh, with that kind of knowledge. But I, I probably need to be going at this point, but right. uh, I think that's a really good place to leave it with this idea of the need for people who are on the right politically or people who understand these philosophical ideas to be engaged in this amazing thing, with things that are being done to help shape that. It's good for our own lives, but it's also going to be good for increasing that understanding of the value of uh, good ideas. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So for, for audience, realclearfuture.com, realclearpolitics.com. Uh, realclearfuture.com and trzinskyletter.com, which is my, uh, my own newsletter, which you get everything. You get the Atlas Shrugged stuff, you get the, the technology stuff, you get this, uh, the politics things that I'm writing for the Federalist. You get all of that sort of uh, uh, through there. Great. Well, so in the name of the best within us, thanks, thanks for helping the world become more of an Ayn Rand hero. I appreciate that. Thank you very much for having me on. Got it. It's been an enjoyable discussion. Thanks. The Becoming an Ayn Rand Hero podcast is sponsored by the composer Darren John Lewis, whose music I use for this podcast. If you'd like a custom choral or symphonic piece for your special event or celebration, or if you'd just like to hear more of his music, Go to DarrenJohnLewis.com. That's D-A-R-I-N-J-O-H-N-L-E-W-I-S.com. Thank you. And see you in the next episode of Becoming an Ayn Rand Hero.